Thank you to our Slavic choir. What a beautiful offering to the Lord. And thank you for all the time and energy that goes into preparing to serve God and to bless us. As we get ready this morning for the message, I just want to give you a good word as we go into this. Uh, actually, this is a sermon that's going to be focusing on how to stay strong and accomplish what God wants us to do. But we are uh, very, very close to and maybe even beyond reaching our goal. We're waiting for pledges to come in. Uh, we signed to purchase the property for our medical and media and other missions uh, 12 days from today. Can you say amen? amen? Now, we're not closing off the giving because uh, we believe that God's moved on people's hearts. Uh, we don't, to my knowledge, have all the funds in yet, and we just believe that there's probably a few other things we may need to do when we get the property. So if God's moved on your heart to do something, please go ahead and do it. Market healing and teaching. It'll go into this fund, and uh, we'll see what God continues to do in our midst. But God has stepped in and exceeded our expectations, which is, in my mind, God saying, I have something for you to do, and I want you to go about doing it now. So let's pray. Lord, we are gathered here so thankful that Jesus did become a human being, God with us, Emmanuel. And as we come into the time in which the world reflects on what the incarnation has meant to the human race and meant to the universe, the entire cosmos looking on to see a revelation of your character. I pray, Lord, may we be ready, instant in season and out of season, to do our part. It appears to us now, Lord, that you are moving things rapidly, and so you must expect, Lord, that we move rapidly with you. So give us the focus and the understanding, the unity, the togetherness, the resources, the resolve. And bless this message now, I pray in Jesus' name, amen entitled my message this morning, The Weapons of Our Warfare. It's a phrase that comes from the book of Corinthians where Paul is needing to defend his ministry. And in the midst of that defense, he reminds the people that his appointment as an apostle is not something of his own doing. Now, I have to admit that the last few weeks have been quite a journey of awe watching God at work. Uh, we are told through inspiration that the final movements will be rapid ones. And I think we've tended to think of that as the rallying of the forces of evil to persecute the remnant of God's church who is true, who keeps the commandments of God and has testimony of Jesus. But I think after reflecting and looking at the Word, I'm quite convinced that the final movements will be rapid ones on both sides of the great controversy. While the devil is diligent, like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour, God's people will become and are becoming more diligent in making sure there's a light, there is a call to a sanctuary that is in Christ himself. And that sanctuary is the beautiful teaching of a God who died as a lamb, is mediating on our behalf, and is getting ready to pronounce that he who is just, let him be just still, and he who is unholy, let him be unholy still. So as I'm reflecting this morning with you, I'm thinking to the state of many of our churches in the Seventh-day Adventist faith, because to my knowledge, there is no other church that understands that all of the Ten Commandments are a transcript of God's character and an invitation into a relationship by putting off some things and embracing others. To my knowledge, there is no other church on the face of the planet who sees the Old and New Testament together as a gospel message, who does believe that these commandments should be kept and that there is a living presence of Christ, both faith in Him and the Spirit of Him in a prophetic message of invitation and hope. I'm quite convinced that we are moving rapidly towards the showdown, 
and some of the experiences of the last few years have shown us that we're going to have to know how to be beautiful, sweet, noble people and live by our convictions, which are rooted in the Word of God. And that the ability to stand apart and be different and to answer the call, as Moses gave at the base of Sinai, who's on the Lord's side? And as I watch this conformity society that's ever connected, perhaps in some very perverse, perverse ways, I'm convinced that God's people right now are to be rallying and readying to stand in the gap, to declare that they are on, on the side of Christ, that they come in the name of the Lord. Now, when I look at many of the Seventh-day Adventist churches, I think to myself, what a shell of vibrancy and vitality to what they have been in the past. And it saddens me to see churches that are slowly losing their vitality and dying. And I'm convinced that God wants to revive his people, and I'm convinced there's no secrets. As a matter of fact, I was at a wedding the other day. My wife and I included a little financial gift, and I wrote on the card, there are no new secrets about how to have a happy marriage. And I'm here to tell you there's no new secrets about how to have a vibrant, healthy church. So I'm going to go over some things today with you, and I hope as you listen, you'll ask yourself, have I allowed the Lord Jesus Christ, the commander of the Lord of hosts, to speak to me as to how I fit into this mighty army? Because when we end this message today, we're going to sing that powerful song, Onward Christian Soldiers. And these songs are full of directive and encouragement and theological understanding that are important to us. I'm convinced today that the devil is stealing a march on God's people. He's looking for a place where they're not paying attention, and he doesn't have much of a hard time finding one. He's looking for a place where they're living by sight, not by faith, and he's not having a hard time finding one. He's looking for a place where people know how to wield the sword, love the lost, and love each other, and he's having a hard place finding one. And I'm here to tell you today, God's calling us, all of us, whether you're watching online or you're sitting here today, to recognize the marks of divine providence, the principles and the precepts of the Word of God, because God never does anything where there's not vibrancy and fruitfulness and fragrance and freedom that comes from His presence. So this morning... I'm going to outline for how this church can continue to move in the direction of strength. And if you're listening somewhere else, especially if you're a pastor or a parent or a teacher, may these things be put into practice individually so that we can know them corporately in an aggregate sense and experience what God wants to do. Because in the end, God's going to have an army. The question is, Will we constitute it or will we be absent without leave or worse than that? May we experience a life and a choice that leads to a shaking and a treasonous discharge from the forces of light and truth. Sober, serious, but I want to tell you something. When I read the history of this church and I look back to its first 40 or 50 years, I have desired of God Lord, allow me to experience something like that in the church. Allow me to be a part of what's going on with the vibrancy and the victory, from victory to victory. And I believe God's going to do it again. It'd be sad if we had to miss out. So this morning, let's take a ride and let's see what those weapons are. Open your Bibles, first of all, if you would, to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11. I'm going to start with some very simple things. They are simple to say and simple to understand and a little hard to put into practice. Faith, the weapons of our warfare. Now, I'm not going through the book of Ephesians chapter 6 and looking at the, the helmet and all these things. I'm aware of those things. I'm choosing to go a different route this morning. Of course, some of them will overlap. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Hebrews 11, verse 6. Now, Paul will challenge the Hebrew listeners, readers, to make sure they don't make the mistakes of their Hebrew forefathers. Now, we are all spiritual sons of Abraham. We are all, by faith, children of Jesus Christ, heirs of the promise through Jesus. We are all spiritual Israelites, Hebrews, Jews, this book of Hebrews is written to everybody. 
And we are going to be reminded that some things are impossible. It says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to him must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, I'll be the first to tell you that when we started down the journey that we were on, in regards to the last few weeks and the dynamics of expanding the base of ministry for Jesus, if somebody would have said to me, within about three or four weeks, you're going to be there, I would have said, wow, that'll be pretty awesome. I could have no idea that along the way that the sweet spirit affirmed by the principles and the precepts of the Word and the directives of Ellen White would be affirmed so radically by the divine hand. But I do know this, if I had been an Israelite coming out of Egypt, I would have wanted been amongst the tribe of Caleb or Joshua to where the leaders of the faith journey could have confidence and more faith as they watch the journey go. And I know beyond the shadow of a doubt, what God is doing is he's seeking to write his own spiritual chapters of faith in all of our lives and corporately. But I do know this, when God says to do something and you know he said it and you don't do it, not only are you disobeying him, but you're missing out on the confidence that would grow for the bigger challenges that are in front of you. The lion and the bear that David wrestled with fought with and slayed on the side of the mountain was just a stepping stone to the mightiest warrior of the Philistine army by the name of Goliath. But by the time he got to Goliath, his walk with God was strong enough, his confidence in God's provision large enough that he could say to him, you come to me with all those weapons hanging on your body, but I've only come with one weapon, and that's God who's determined that this will be the last day you stand vertical on the face of the earth. And this is how it's going to be right to the very end. But imagine how pathetic it was to be in the army for 40 days and listen to him come out and taunt, and nobody said, enough is enough. We've listened to you long enough. Unfortunately, just like Elijah on Mount Carmel, he gathers everybody near and he says, if the Lord be God, serve him. And you know what they all said? Nothing. They stood there in silence. Nobody was willing to say, I believe we needed a divine manifestation. God sent one. He recharged the faith of the faithful, even some of those that weren't faithfully willing to speak up. And he said to them, in answer to Elijah's prayer, because you remember Elijah said, Lord, show them that you're God, that I'm your servant, and I've done these things at your command. And the fire was down on the altar. The water was gone. The stones were gone. The offering was gone. And the people were on their faces. God steps in because it's not our faith that gets us to heaven. It's our confidence in God, which he writes, it's his authorship. But I'm here to tell you today, you can't constitute a church that's full of faithful people unless individually they all practice a little faith. So the first object you need to do is figure out what God wants. And you need to be in his word and you need to be on your knees and you need to be humble and willing to do what he says because There's no sense continuing to tell somebody to go forward if constantly every time you tell them they they entrench themselves, they dig in their heels, or they go sideways or even worse, backwards. But if you're going to have faith, you need to have faith in something. Now take your Bibles if you would and go back to the book of Hosea. Book of Hosea. Find Daniel. That's the easiest way to do this because you get into those minor prophets. Get past Ezekiel and Daniel. And the next book you're going to find is the book of Hosea. The book of Hosea. Now, some of these that I'll say are, that I'm going to go over you with are very closely related. Very closely related. Hosea chapter 4. If you want to have the weapons of heavenly warfare on your side, then you're going to need to know a little something. Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. It says, My people are destroyed for lack of what? Knowledge. Because you've rejected knowledge. It's not that nobody said anything to them. Their prophets and their priests, at least some of them, did declare truth. But they decided that they enjoyed their secular lifestyle. It wasn't that it was without God, we still have the routines, the regimens of religion, 
but they were without a love for the truth, which, by the way, the New Testament will tell us sets us up to believe a lie of our own making. He says, I will also, because you've rejected knowledge, reject you from being my priest. Since you've forgotten the law of your God, I'll also forget your children. Boy, God is pretty tough. There's certain things God warns very powerfully. There's something about our role as the remnant that calls us to fulfill, as it were, an intermediary role between a lost world and a saving God. But in order for that to happen, we can't be distracted and be without knowledge of truth. You know, the hardest thing for a pastor nowadays, or a conference president, or somebody in a union, or division, or general conference office, the hardest thing is to hold people together. That's one of the hardest things. And we know from the book of Amos, chapter 3, how can two walk together unless they be agreed? If you don't read the same information, if you don't believe in the same inspiration, if it's not bouncing around inside your cranium for your points of reference, then every survey and every study becomes a new point of reference on which the church of God can divide as they walk by sight, not by faith. We need to be reading the Bible. So we're getting ready to start up again. Some are continuing on. I know one of the nice routines in the Kelly house right now is that My wife reads to me a little bit every night as I'm laying there. That's good because I don't fall asleep fast. My mind is still kind of running. My wife, on the other hand, her head hits the pillow and it's not too many seconds and she's gone. So what she's doing is she's getting me to where I can fall asleep. I I lay there listening to her read. And as I listen, my mind gets rested. And I'm about ready to fall asleep when she's done. We need to come back to being people of the Word because, and of the spirit of prophecy, by the way, because without having the same base of inspiration and information, we're prone to disagree and come apart at every level. All right, let's go to the third one. Turn to Psalm 127. Psalm 127. We're going to have to have faith and we're going to have to have knowledge. And I've not got these in order. I may rearrange the order between now and the second service. But what I want you to know this morning is that we're going to have to have one other thing, actually several other things. Psalm 127, and I want to look at the last half, verses 3 to 5. Psalm 127. It's a beautiful thing. God tells us in the first half of the psalm, if you want your spiritual house built up, it's going to have to be built by the Lord. We know that Jesus is the foundation stone of the church and should be the foundation of our homes. But when we come to verse 3, I want you to see something that's very important. It says, Behold, children are a gift from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are children of one's youth. How blessed is the man whose quiver, that's where you put the arrows, is full of them. He will not be ashamed, or they will not be ashamed, when they speak with their enemies in the gate. Now, Psalm 127 and 128 are about happy homes. But I want to ask you something. What is a quiver full of arrows for in the hand of a warrior? Is it not to shoot to hit the target? Is the target not supposed to be the enemy? What you need to understand is that in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6, when God says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one. And he goes on to say, write these things. Put them on your put them on your." wrist, put them on your forehead, talk about them when you walk, talk about when you sit down and eat. What God is saying is, you need to be focusing your family's life and understanding in the great controversy. Your children need to understand that they are an iteration of you in the next generation to carry forward in an honoring way, commandment number five, the values that you've put into them. And without placing those values in them and without focusing their lives, they can become unfocused and refocused on making money. I just had the privilege of writing with a very educated person in this community to a meeting we needed to share. And as this person visited with me, they talked about their children. And they explained that one of their children was very, very intelligent, which wouldn't surprise me. This was a very intelligent person, and the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. But they said that someone noticed how intelligent he was, and they offered him a big job working in finance, 
And then the commentary of this person was quite interesting to me. They said, and you know how that usually works, all that money comes with it a corresponding lack of spirituality. And sure enough, that person's out of the church, but they're in the path of pleasure and frivolity and fun, and they've got all the toys that every young man who grows to be a middle-aged man who finds out hopefully before he's an old man don't matter very much. Our children are to be the central focus on the greater focus, which is the fact that we're locked in a battle for their eternal good, our eternal good, and the world's eternal good. And God never intended that we should do anything but remind them that quivers full of arrows are only for hitting targets. And the target of our parenting is not to teach the children that the church is peripheral or the battle between right and wrong is somehow out on the edges of priority or low down on the list. We're supposed to be showing them that they're a part of the hero generation, that they're going to face off with the Goliaths. And when the adults are thrown in jail, some of them are going to preach the three angels' messages. But we can hardly do this when church is simply a, a, an item on the to-do list and it's not at the top. Paul says it this way. He goes on to say, this one thing I do, forgetting what's behind me, I press on towards the mark of the high calling of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to reach out for those things which are before because there's a prize at the end of the race. He says, I don't beat the air. I'm hitting my target. His life was a living illustration of the focus that he calls us to. And that focus is going to require some discipleship. It's going to require remaking of our priorities. I'm here to tell you, friends, there's two armies on the face of the earth. One is rallying its forces around the the uh, standard of selfishness, and I don't think the other is hardly rallying at all. I want you to understand, here, here's a good little illustration you can pray about. Our civil rights laws in this state have changed. And now, in the new civil rights law in the state of Michigan, there's no carve-out for religious institutions. And because the civil rights laws have changed and there's no carve-out for religious institutions, think schools, think churches, because the civil rights law has changed and there's no carve-out for religious institutions, you could have a lawsuit against you if you don't hire somebody who believes in the full spectrum of diversity, equity, and inclusion. I don't want to be oblique here. What I'm saying is somebody who has an LGBTQ ideology could now leverage the law against us. Well, what's the matter? I'll tell you what it matters. Right now, the Catholic Church is suing the state of Michigan. And there's two other entities that have joined in with them. The Jewish faith-based community and the Islamic faith-based community. Maybe it's time for the Seventh-day Adventist Church to realize that there's a lot of little skirmishes leading up to the Seventh-day Sabbath showdown and make sure we're in the game on the rest of the Decalogue and our ability in a free society to have our own religious identity, and that involves Christian teachers and preachers who hold to the value systems that have been embraced for the last century and a half. Yes, there's to be a focus in our lives. And without that focus, we don't even know what to aim at. I'm going to run out of time, but, there are, but we're going to look at some more Bible scriptures. Go to the book of Joshua, chapter 1. Joshua, chapter 1. I may get to where I'm just going to start reading them off to you. But not this one, Joshua chapter 1. I'm going to tell you, not only do we need faith, not only do we need knowledge, not only do we need focus, but if we're going to take up the weapons of our warfare, we're going to need to be obedient. Obedient. Now, this is a bad word in American society because all law and authority is deemed an inhibitory or obstacle in the self-actualization or the development of the person. But I'm here to tell you today, it doesn't matter how smart you are, it doesn't matter how much experience you have, there's a little bit of simplicity in this. It's not going to be man's stratagem, although stratagem can matter. It's not going to be man's intelligence and great experience that creates the victories and the deliverance. It's going to be something much simpler. Joshua chapter 1. It says, every place on which, verse 3, every place on which the sole of your foot treads I've given to you, just as I spoke to Moses. That sounds like a pretty encouraging word to a man who's got to go take up mountains full of walled cities. 
from the wilderness of this Lebanon, even as far as the great river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, as far as the great sea, that's the Mediterranean, towards the setting of the sun, will be your territory. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I've been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Don't turn to it from the right or to the left so that you can have success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate it on day and night. Sounds like the same focus we just looked at. So that you may be careful to do according to all that's written in it, for then you'll make your way prosperous and then you'll have success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Don't tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Now, if we're going to have success, we're going to have to have obedience. Just like we read before out of the book of Hosea, if we're going to have to success, we're going to have to have a knowledge of the Word of God. If we're going to have success, we're going to have to make sure that we allow principle and precept to keep us on the narrow road. But I ask myself, why don't we have more success? Why don't we? Because I believe at some level we've gotten pretty good at relegating some of the things God said to the preferred or unpreferred list. Last night my mother-in-law was sitting in her chair listening to a video on Hudson Taylor. And uh, I've been traveling and losing sleep at night for a couple different nights. And it's like I'm, I'm... phasing in and out, but I woke up long enough to hear Hudson Taylor say that the Matthew 28, 18 to 20 commission is not a suggestion. It is a directive, and obedience matters. Hudson Taylor would say, if I had a thousand dollars to give, I'd give it all to China. He said, if I had a thousand lives to live, I'd give them all to China. And he said, no, if I had a thousand lives to live, I'd give them all to Christ. Somehow, we upon whom the ends of the earth have come are going to have to come back to some very simple, basic things if we want to be like a mighty army moves the church of God. If we want to be terrible with banners of which the world takes notice and some trembling itself, we're going to have to come back to this book of the law. You know what that means? It means some of the things you're looking at on your device you won't be looking at anymore. And some of the ways you're wasting time you won't be wasting anymore. It means some of the way you're spending your money you won't be spending anymore. And it means some of those places where the wrong focus will be replaced with the right focus, God's people will come together to say, you know what, there's a work to do. I believe beyond the shadow of a doubt that the experience of the last month here has been God's way of saying, you're on the right track, now get going. And I believe that slowly over time, the mission focus of this church and the discipleship of its leaders And the refocus on the simple things of the Bible and the spirit of prophecy has been preparing us to embrace larger things. But it's going to require obedience. We're not going to look this next one up. But if we're going to be victorious and we're going to know what the weapons of our warfare are, we're going to have to have readiness. 2 Timothy 2.4 says, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, rebuke, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering. A few years back, we needed a new roof on this church. We started raising money for it. But in the midst of raising money for it, God made it clear that I know you need a new roof. He said, but there's 200 plus, actually there's 200,000 members in El Salvador. And I think they needed like 500 churches. I want you to go ahead and focus on giving somebody else something that isn't going to do anything for you. I can remember the conversation I had with somebody that was very frustrated that somehow a thermometer in the bulletin wasn't going to get the same kind of attention because now there was a mission element that the leadership was putting out in front of the people. Well, you know what? 
I actually genuinely believe that no one person knows the best thing for this church to do. I actually believe there's a process of prayer and dialogue to determine God's will. But I'm going to assure you that when you follow that process and you create an environment where you can pray and talk and disagree, agreeably, that you can get to the place where you know God's will. And I can tell you beyond the shadow of a doubt that it was not my job after processing those steps to say to this person, I'm sorry this frustrates you or makes you afraid, but I know that God up above knows that we need a roof on this church, but when he wants to interject into our plans that we take a left instead of a right, or if we move in a different direction instead of straight ahead with what we know we need, he's going to be there to take care of us. And not only did he take care of us by keeping this roof from not doing its job, but at the end of the day, he gave us a whole roof to boot. Somebody should say amen. That's money that didn't come out of your pockets. And there's a reason. Because those who honor me, Jesus says in the book of Samuel, I will honor. And we're going to have to learn to live by faith, not by sight. And I can tell you there's hundreds, yea, thousands of churches around the world, 6,000 of them in this division, and how many of them are living the wrong way, I don't know. But they're corporately looking out for themselves when God says to them, wait a minute, I'm looking out for you. How about if you do what I asked and look out for somebody else? And I want to say thank you to Carl Kaufman, the head of our religion department when I graduated in 1987, who gave me a concept that nobody else ever gave me since or before. And he said, your congregations can be corporately self-centered. Man, that stuck in my head. All congregation is is a bunch of people. You get the wrong kind of people together and you can have the wrong kind of congregation. And I'm afraid some of those 6,000, they're operating by sight, not by faith. There is no healthy trust and respect in the leadership circles. There is no dependence on prayer. There is no divine administration. Because who wants to frustrate somebody like, like we frustrated this individual? And by the way, lots of times the frustration points, the tip of the spear is often the pastor. That's okay. I signed up for it. And I just want to say to you, on the other side of those hours of conversation, two of them I had, long conversations. I have no doubt we did the right thing. Now I know, based on what's working out right now with this property next to us, we're headed into some other headwinds. I can guarantee you, God didn't send us the great spirit and the great resources to take the next step without knowing that we're going to bump into a few, you know, I've been on airplane a lot recently. You know, I'm used to it when it bounces around a little bit, but when I can look out the window and see the wings going like this, like a bird, I don't like it, all right? And I was on an airplane once where one of the big jet engines quit. I told you about that. I didn't like that either. But I'm here to assure you, if Jesus is in the cockpit and he's in the pilot seat and we are... We are prone to let him speak and lead when he comes over the intercom and he says, you know, folks, we're going to go through a little bit of turbulence. It's okay. I know how to get us through to the next airport. We can be okay. But I'm here to tell you, I'm confident that God's given us this chapter to get us ready for the next chapter. And I don't know what it is. Yes, we need to be ready to change and move around. Now, I'm going to go quickly because I'm out of time. Obviously, we need the Holy Spirit. There's no way to go about what we're doing without God's guiding His presence in us. But we need unity. By God's grace, this village church embraces a beautiful spirit. But I want to look up some of these texts. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm convinced, and Ellen White says so, that the greatest manifestation of the spirit in our midst is our unity. And I believe that that unity has to be shaped by a missionary mindedness because otherwise all we're doing is critiquing each other's ideas about how to keep the lights on and the place warm. And by the way, if nobody ever made another offering appeal for keeping the lights on and the place warm, the pastor would be very happy. And uh, I don't know exactly what pastor has said in his offering appeal, so hopefully Pastor Hesh, didn't say that. But if you did, or anybody else does, that's not our call to keep the lights on and the place warm. That's something we do at our own house. Of course, we're going to do it here. We've got a whole lot more to do than keep the lights on and the place warm. Go to, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, looking at verse 10. What does God have in mind? 
it says, Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete. Some of your Bibles say perfect in the same mind and in the same judgment. If you would, turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. Ellen White will write in Acts of the Apostles in the first few chapters that the early church had unity of feeling, thought, and action. You cannot get feeling, thought, and action all lined up the same way unless certain things happen. One of those is the presence of the Spirit. Another one is a knowledge of the Word. Another one is proper respect for structure and authority and leadership. Another one is a little bit of love for each other because you know each other and you've shared a few things together. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. Last little bit to the most con uh, tumultuous church of the New Testament. It says, finally, brethren, rejoice, be made complete, be comforted, be like-minded, live in peace, and the, love of, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Go back to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. And we're going to look these up, even though we're running out of time. Acts chapter 4. And we'll look at verse 32. Why was this church so powerful in the beginning? It was the presence of the uplifted Christ and His Spirit. It was solid teaching by the deacons and the elders and the apostles. Acts chapter 4, verse 32. It says, And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and that none of them claimed that anything that belonged to them was his own, but all things were common property to them. That's a special kind of unity. Flip over to the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, looking at verse 2. Philippians Chapter 2, looking at verse 2. Philippians 2, verse 2. We'll read verse 1. Therefore, if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection of compassion, if these things actually exist, then make my joy complete. If this is real... Make my joy complete by having the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in the Spirit, intent on one purpose, doing nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regarding one another as more important than yourselves. Wow, that can be kind of tough to do when you're in a university community with so many powerful-minded people and dedicated people, this might be hard to achieve. But Paul didn't say, achieve it everywhere except for where there's institutions of higher education. No, what Paul said, if any of it's real, prove it by being united. It doesn't mean you think exactly the same, but it means you do do this. You recognize when pride of opinion or insecurity of person is in the way of unity. I'm gonna go quick. Colossians 3, 13 and 14 says, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Jesus prayed in John 17 for perfect unity like the Trinity had. We're to maintain our goodwill through a relationship with Christ. And when it's strained, we're to have good communication to solve our problems. And we're to have a high level of commitment. We cannot replace a shared vision or a shared experience or shared commitments with anything else. There's to be a sweetness and a warmth and an affection in our midst that can't be gained when we are separated from each other too much and don't believe the same things. It can't happen when our leaders especially don't have the maturity to know how to deal with the immature impatience but deal with firmness and kindness, which the next issue is leadership. Paul wrote to Titus, he said, these things speak to you, exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. I'm going to tell you there's a reason why a lot of churches don't work, and that's because there's not enough respect engendered by the love and the courage of the leaders to make sure the rest of the people know you can't run this church through the, through the spectrum of dysfunction. You don't like everything that goes on? Well, you don't like everything that goes on in your own house. Why do you think you're going to like everything that goes on in the church? But I can tell you this, when the leaders don't know how to exhort, that's a strong encouragement to do right, rebuke, which is a challenge to break off with wrong, with all authority, 
and they let people despise them in the name of being nice. Listen, everybody should be nice. But I'm here to tell you there are times when iron is going to sharpen iron because there are some people who are so dysfunctional and out of bounds that they've learned how to bully and push unless somebody steps up to the plate and says, sorry, bullying and pushing doesn't work in the family of God. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter how much education you have. It doesn't matter how many people that are related to you into this church or know you in this community. It doesn't work here. We regard all men equally. We believe that all people filled with the Spirit have something to contribute that's going on, and we believe in structure and order. Paul spends three chapters, listen to me, three chapters in a book called 2 Corinthians that is only 13 chapters long. He spends three chapters reorienting their wrong idea of how leadership works. And he basically says to them, you're saying all these bad things about me when I'm not there. Like your letters are powerful, but your presence isn't. Like you can write strong, but you don't speak well. And Paul's going to spend three chapters in the end of that book saying, listen, I will be in my presence what I am in my letters when I come. I hope I don't need to be. Yeah, that's how granular these books are. You talk about real church. Praise the Lord for the inspiration of scriptures that writes down all the, the missteps of the early church. Praise God. Structure, order, and organization matter. Our world church, our division church, they're in terrible shape right now, partially because everybody's doing what's right in their own eyes. And it doesn't work. And sometimes you just have to be patient and people do suffer. Enthusiasm. Paul said, Romans 12, 1, I urge you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. He goes on to say in verse 11 of the same book, don't lag behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Prayer. Jesus said, if two of three of you get together and pray, I'm listening. Where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there in the midst. And how about a spirit of service? You know what? You can't be a drink offering and be poured out. You can't have the mind of Christ who went from the highest to the lowest. You can't do these things without having the presence of Jesus in your heart. Now listen. I've never been prouder of a church than I am of the one I'm part of right now. I've never been more in awe of what God is doing in a westernized, rich, Laodicean experience than I see what the Lord is doing right now. I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that he's looking to do a whole lot more. I'm convinced he wants us to press together, love each other, pray with each other, talk with each other, encourage each other, sometimes challenge each other, and certainly challenge the world that its narratives for harmony and happiness are off, its ideologies for self-fulfillment are wrong. I'm convinced beyond the shadow of doubt if ever the world needed the church, he sure does, but it sure does need it now. The truth of the matter is, I believe that when our mission is at the center, when we're not ignorant about the Bible, it's precept and principle. When we seek the Spirit, when we respect and talk to each other, when we commit ourselves to the task, when we want the world to know what Jesus said, they have a right to know, and I've, I've laden you with a responsibility to tell them. I'm completely convinced that the highest order of joy will be in a part of this mighty, remnant, religious army that can't be divided, is focused, and won't stop because at the head of the army is the Lord Jesus Christ who's lifted up a standard as the enemy has come in like a flood. And I'm convinced today that the final movements will be rapid ones and we ought to be about our business. And I'm convinced today Adventism will have a more glorious conclusion than it had beginning. And I know that many will be shaken out because, what do you want to call it, there have been no boot camp to their introduction into the army of God. Woe be unto you pastors listening to me who do not require a boot camp experience of some level, patient and careful. You can't force anybody to do anything. It's a, it's a volunteer organization. But man, you ought to take advantage of the moral authority and the call from God to actually call people to come up to higher ground. This is where we're at. And I really do believe there'd be nothing like 6,000 Seventh-day Adventist churches from Canada to Guam to Bermuda 
to the southernmost point of Texas, working together to weaponize their money, their prayers, their education, and everything else to say, you know what? There's to be a new burst of light. And everybody ought to know what's going on so they can make a decision about whether or not they want to reject their eternal inheritance or embrace it in the name of Christ. This is where we're at. And I'm appealing to all my brothers and sisters that will hear this message, especially the ones that share church membership with me at Village. Let's continue leaning in. And let's cut out the things that won't help us. God bless us. Praise the Lord for what he's doing. And may we anticipate a few more skirmishes and all-out battles along the way. Let's stand together and sing about it in the song Onward Christ.